Good evening. I'm Adam Weinberg, the Alice Pratt Brown Director of the Whitney Museum. It's my great pleasure to introduce you tonight to the screening of Danny Lyon's extraordinary new film, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, otherwise known as SNCC. This is a film that only Danny Lyon could make, and true to Lyon is both a deeply personal story and a history. It's vulnerable, emotional, candid, yet it is a factual documentation of the history of the United States in the 20th century. SNCC was one of the key organizations in the civil rights movement in the 1960s. SNCC empowered America's youth to work for racial equality in the belief that history was not fixed, but up to them to change. In 1962, Danny Lyon was employed by James Foreman, SNCC's executive secretary, as the first official photographer. He also worked under John Lewis, and Julian Bond, which gave him a unique perspective, not just on the struggle for civil rights, but on the inner strategies, struggles, and workings of SNCC in the movement. Foreman understood that to make history, one had to record it and reveal it for the world to see. And Lyon was not just an outside spectator, but a photographer filmmaker who was immersed in these events and lived them. The voter registrations, the marches, the protests, and the violent attacks of the police the National Guard, and the Klan on peaceful demonstrators. While his images were used to help to raise money for SNCC and create a public image, what made his work so powerful was the way it transgressed the line between observer and participant. And just as the line between fact and memoir is blurred, this film tells two stories, the story of SNCC and the story of a 60-year friendship with the late Congressman John Lewis. In 1962, Danny was a student at the University of Chicago and went to photograph demonstrators at a segregated swimming pool in Cairo, Illinois, where he met Lewis, a young field secretary of SNCC. This film traces the story of their relationship and the ongoing struggle for civil rights in the United States, outlasting their youth and continuing over decades until Lewis's death, death this past July. In the film, Danny and John consider their shared history over decades. We also hear from other participants in SNCC at different moments, looking at back what, at what they accomplished. This film weaves together so many of Danny Lyon's abiding preoccupations as an artist. It includes hundreds of his photographs from his time at SNCC, as well as films made over the ensuing decades as he continued to document the struggle for racial injustice in the United States. It is a collage, a mosaic, that provides shards of information and insights into the struggles, contradictions, and agony of the times. After the screening of the 75-minute film, I will lead a conversation between the artist and one of his dear friends and colleagues in the, in the, in the SNCC um, movement, Joyce Ladner, who is an esteemed scholar and activist. Joyce appears in the film in Danny's photographs. Joyce, it is truly an honor to have you here with us tonight to watch this film and talk about SNCC with Danny. I'll just end by saying um, this film is accomplished, yet it's not resolved. It doesn't offer answers. It provides an unvarnished narrative of the courageous activities and the heroic individuals who made up the organization. Seeing this film now in the context of Black Lives Matter makes us realize that the struggle goes on and on Although much was accomplished by these dedicated individuals who gave their lives to the movement, much more has yet to be attained. Thank you very much for joining us. Now to the film. Let's start our video. Yeah. Hello, Danny. Hello, Danny. Hello, Joyce. Uh, just trying to find you here. Um, close some of these windows. I'll just oh, Joyce, you gotta push push your screen down a hair. It's chopping off your chin. Right. There you go. Great. Well, first of all, Danny, thank you for this um, great gift of this film. I'm on. Excuse me. I, 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 we can hear you, Joyce. Okay. We can hear you too. Oh, we're we're in a good place. Let me just first of all, Danny, um, thank you. This was. Um, amazing. I've seen the film a number of times now and I see new things in it each time I see it. And um, I want to thank you, Joyce, um, a good friend and colleague from SNCC, 
of Danny's who, uh, for being here with us tonight. I just wanted to say, you know, just a very few quick words um, of introduction to each, even though I think you got a little bit of a sense of it. Um, you know, Danny, as you all see tonight, is an incredible artist, photographer, filmmaker, writer, thinker, and his work really transcends all genres. And he personally engages and involves himself in the lives of his subjects, which makes him both participant and at the same time an observer. Um, and what I'm always struck by, Danny, in looking at these is they're not time capsules, they're not self-contained, they're not stuck in a moment of history, but they're active, they're compelling, they're raw, they're fluid, and they're alive. Danny has rejected the traditional documentary approach in favor of a really immersive and a complex relationship with his subjects. As he said, you put a camera in my hand, I want to get close to people, not just physically close, but emotionally close, all of it. Through this process, he has shaped many iconic bodies of works and photographs, and he's produced more than a dozen films. And we at the Whitney are very proud and pleased that he has had two solo exhibitions at the museum, both organized by our curator, Elizabeth Sussman. The first was in 2007, Danny Lyon montage film and still photography. And most recently um, co-organized um, with the San Francisco Legion of Honor, Danny Lyon's message to the future, which I hope some of you have a chance to see. A few words about Joyce, which are not, not nearly sufficient to um, recognize all that she has done, but uh, Dr. Joyce Ladner is a scholar, a civil rights activist, she was born and raised in Mississippi. She and her sister, Dory, and I believe Dory is on tonight, so thank you, Dory, for joining us as well. And who Dory was also a major leader in the movement with the first generation in their family to go to college. As Joyce said, my mother, who went to the fourth grade, always said, if you get an education, nobody can take that away from you. Joyce took her mother's encouragement to heart and worked hard to balance her academic work with her activism. And after she was expelled from Jackson State for participating in sit-in demonstrations, she enrolled in Tougaloo College graduated with a degree in sociology in 1964. As a student, Joyce participated in voter registration drives and she helped organize the March on Washington under Bayard Rustin, who we saw tonight in the film, and was deeply involved with the SNCC in Mississippi and elsewhere throughout the South. Alongside of act, her act, activism, Joyce continued her studies. She earned a PhD from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri in 1968 and became a noted sociologist. Dr. Ladner transformed her passion for social and political activism into writing, teaching, and advocacy. And among her many, many accomplishments, she served as vice president for academic affairs at Howard University from 1999 to 1994, and as an interim president of the university from 94 to 95. So I wanna thank you both for being here this evening. I also want to acknowledge that there a number of other people um, were involved in the movement, and I noticed that Dorothy Zellner was on tonight too, and I just want to welcome you and express my greatest admiration, um, admiration for, for all of you, all you have done, and all that your um, spirit and your hard work has represented and represents for the next generation. I'm gonna start, I really want the conversation to be primarily between Danny and Joyce, and then we are gonna open it up for some questions. And um, Danny, I am gonna ask you a few questions about the film per se, but I'd like to start with just a few questions for both of you about the movement to give a little framing. You know, Something that I didn't fully understand is what is the difference between the SCLC and SNCC? How did, how, did, how, did, how did one define the other? I mean, I just always thought of them as contemporaneous, but clearly they had a relationship to one another. I don't know whether you wanna start with that, Joyce or Danny. I will start. Uh, SNCC was uh, organized, formed uh, in uh, 1960 at Shaw University in North Carolina. Um, the call went out to the students who had been involved in the sit-in movement to come for a conference. And I think I heard someone say at some point that Dr. King wanted the students to be affiliated with like a student arm of the SCLC. Uh, Ella Baker, who issued the call, uh, was, uh, I guess, uh, uh, the person to whom we, 
we, we students always looked up to uh, as, a, as a guide and a teacher. Anyway, the students opted to become an independent organization. Um, the SCLC was composed primarily of ministers and their churches, church members, and SNCC uh, was uh, mostly college students in the beginning, but then later uh, other people in the community joined. The final thing I'll say about this is that a great difference between SNCC, SCLC, and NAACP is that Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer said the reason she joined SNCC was because students were not afraid, they were courageous, unlike the older people in the organizations of SCLC and SNCC. And um, she said there was always a lot more energy involved and, and young people were willing to take stands that older folks were not. Um, for the young people to uh, uh, you know, it's an interesting question. Anyway, as I understood, there were five groups, including the Urban League, the NAACP, uh, Dr. King's group, which were older ministers, and, and there was a fifth one, right? Four. Joyce? Four. Four, 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 correct. Four. Four. So, uh, and, you know, CORE was not a membership organization. I mean, well, uh, let me get this right. SNCC has staff members. I mean, to actually say I was in SNCC, that meant you were on the staff. CORE was, you could just send the money and say I'm in CORE. So it was very different, meaning there were thousands of people who would say I was with CORE. They were, that they, just what, no, they had very, very strong uh, local chapters. CORE did. You know. Active. Right, and when the three boys died, two of them were actually with from core. They were core. But but uh, SNCC had fierce loyalties, and and because it, like being a Dodger fan, if you're a Dodger fan, you hate the Yankees. And I really felt that very very strongly. Uh, for one thing, there was a question of money. SNCC had no money at all. Uh, and people would joke about it for me, would say, go to organize so-and-so, and that was it, you know. And, and other people raised a lot of money, uh, and that's referenced in, in the film. And Dottie said correctly what SNCC really was about. That was kind of the suicide group. Uh, if you think of it, think of it as a Spanish Civil War, where there are all these different people uh, fighting the fascists, but... If something was really dangerous, they sent in the Lincoln Brigade and they all got murdered, you know. And they were willing to do it, partly because they were naive and they were the Lincoln Brigade. But that's true. And, and, in, and Dottie says, you know, if it was dangerous, call SNCC, we'll send someone. And, and the endless examples of this, even at Selma, I think there's a point where Andy Young leaves and Dr. King turns around and it's John Lewis, who is not even representing SNCC, who says, I'm just doing this, and these people are going to kill. I think it's uh, important. Another... I think it's important to distinguish. Uh, uh, I mean, SNCC, as you well know, Danny, it was not an organization where people would just jump out there and go on suicide missions per se. Um, the danger was very calculated, and people tried to stay alive and did not take on. In fact, as a native Southerner, Mississippian, I. Stayed away, stayed away from people, volunteers who came down to the South who wanted to you know, burn the house down in effect uh, because I knew how dangerous it was as a result of having grown up there. And, was, and, and in some ways felt like an interpreter to, to, to Northern volunteers as to what you can do and cannot do. Um, and so on. So I think it's important that, that the risks were taken, but they were calculated. You know. When the March on Washington happened, uh, I, I don't even remember listening to that. I, I probably wandered off and took photographs because I really wasn't interested. And incredibly, there must have been 5,000 professional photographers w within 50 yards of the post. It was filled with press. And everyone was trying to get shot. <laughs> nobody took a picture of John Lewis, except me. I took two. 
figure that one out. And recently <laughs> there's a new biography, but they know it. There's a movie of him which was shot by NBC, but, but there were no photographs made of John Speed except me. And recently a, a historian said that John's speech was actually better than Dr. King's, which we've heard ad nauseum. So there were these rivalries, they were real. Danny, the, the, film, the film begins right. with um, James Foreman, and, and James was the one, I think, who hired you as the first photo official photographer of SNCC. I'm curious, what, you know, what did James mean to each of you, both as an individual and as the, and as the basically, um, you know, the, one of the first founders of SNCC? Well, Jim was um, someone, uh, you know, he was just a very powerful role model. He, he, he was so smart. Um, he knew something about the world. I mean, about, and he could link our struggle with the decolonization movement in other parts of the world, particularly in Africa. Um, he was a very good, uh, he had this uncanny ability to see the big picture and then organize the component parts. A lot of people said Dr. King, for example, could, you know, was very eloquent to the masses, um, but then relied on others to, or, you know, people to actually organize, like White Walker was an organizer in the SCLC. And, and it, Basically, Ella Baker uh, was brought, uh, King brought Ella Baker into um, Atlanta to put the nut, nuts and bolts of the SCLC together. She had been, she and Bayard Rustin had been uh, advisors to him and the Montgomery bus boycott. Uh, but having said that, I think that, that um, uh, uh, Jim, as I said, he, he, he could do both things. He was a, a powerful recruiter. He was an intellectual. He had a very, very strong intellect. And he always told us, write it down, write it down. Meaning uh, that he had a powerful sense of history and he had us file month, uh, weekly reports. Uh, in fact, staff people couldn't get their, their um, $9.64 a week checks unless they filed the report first. But, but I think that's one of the reasons SNCC has the best records, the best kept records that are now digitized. Um, um, SNCDigital.org, I believe it is. Yes. Um, but that's, that's why that Foreman was able to see into the future and to know that if we kept records of what was going on, it would be important for history, but also as a good teaching tool. You know, it's funny you say that, Joyce, because I mean, we're getting up there. And of course, Jim hires me basically when I'm 20, I'm 78. I think I'm still doing this stuff. I'm, I'm doing what Foreman told me to do. I mean, I, and he's been gone for, you know, a long, many too many years. But in a way, I felt that as a SNCC worker, and of course, I'm not a SNCC worker, there hasn't been any SNCC for 40 years. And I was still fulfilling this job. And when I went to Cortland, I'd say, Cortland, can I do this? Can I name the fish film Snick? Is, is that all right? And he used military terms. It was great. He said, you know, you were, you, you were there. You served, which is a military term. And, I, and then I said, Cortland, I can't get it out. No one will show it. Uh, and he said, well, you filled, you fulfilled part, the first half of the mission. Now you have to do part two of the mission. And thanks, Adam, for, for helping us uh, do part two. Jim, Jim this, Ford talked constantly about history. Go ahead. Yeah. In this context, um, SNCC, we call ourselves SNCC veterans because uh, we liken the movement experience as uh, veterans of, in, who served in a war together. So uh, in fact, there's um, one website has a tremendous amount of information about the movement called uh, Crim Vets, Civil Rights Movement Veter Veterans, CRMVET.org. Where, where did the term the movement even come from? And I, lo and I like that because I, that's how they, the I say, relates to the film and the idea that things keep moving and must keep moving. 
I was the media guy, literally, and Foreman said, you, you're good, you do this, do that. And he tells me what to do. So I'm doing photographs. Foreman went to New York and knew Elizabeth Sussman, who was a leftist, who worked for the nation, who was an editor of Simon and Schuster. He made a deal with them, and he later told me he gave him money to do a book. And I said at the time, because so then basically I gave him all my photographs to make the book, which I didn't really care for the book. And I said, call it the movement with a capital M, because I would meet kids like you, just teenagers. And, and there were very many, there were so many teenagers, high school kids, who, who I thought SNCC was sometimes playing catch up. You know, these kids were doing these things spontaneously, they were happening. And then SNCC with some, someone there to organize them. And they, they would say, I'm in the movement, I'm in the movement. But it was a small M. And I said, call it the movement. And they called this book, The Movement. That's what everyone said, like, you know, they were in the movement. I think one of, one of the reasons SNCC people remain the best friends um, now, 60 years later, is because we were all uh, late adolescents, early, early adulthood. Um, coming into our own sense of empowerment and had to stick closely together in order to survive a lot of this. Um, and I, I don't think it would have worked otherwise. Also, the people who were out in the field, you know, worked clo lived too close to the land. You couldn't live on $10 before taxes to be $9.64 a week without living on the land and relying on local people to, to help to help you to survive. Um, and the commitment was the other thing. All of us had been, had come from families, uh, most of us whom I know, come from families who had prepared us for activism, who had told us that um, your generation will have to change things. It was on the, uh, midst of World War II babies. A lot of the fathers and uncles and grandfathers had gone off to fight in the war, World War I and World War II. And the fathers came back from uh, the war um, to the same segregation while they, they observed, you know, white GIs making, taking advantage of the GI education bill, uh, GI housing loan. And black people went back to those same plantations and the democracy they told they went to fight abroad for and expected to have when they got home was not there. And so they passed on to us this sense of, of mission that your generation will have to change things. Uh, one example of that is my, my great uncle who was in World War I used to sit us kids down with him on the porch to listen uh, this before TV, to listen to the Brooklyn Dodgers play. And each time Jesse, uh, Jackie Robinson came to bat um, and made a run, he would jump up and shout, and, and we kids did too. And then he turned very, very seriously to us and say, you will have to be the Jackie Robinsons of your day. Mm -hmm. um, some of the parents had been members of the outlawed NAACP in the South and, and so on. But our parents had, had threaded a needle. They negotiated between keeping us alive and keeping our dignity at the same time. They taught us that kind of survival skill. So um, it was not as though four guys uh, sat in at a lunch counter at Woolworth or a couple of years earlier in Wichita, Kansas had sat, sat in. That one doesn't get very much publicity at all. Uh, one day and decided they were going to just sit there until they got served. You know, you know each generation, you know, had had a sense of mission, and they carried it as far as they could. And then, you know, when they passed it on to us, the time was right. Was, you know, it's interesting that you talk about World War One. I. I think my grandfather fought. He didn't fight. He was in Germany during World War One. And but you're right about previous generations and how they speak to us and through us. The first conversation Adam I, I ever had was about the Russian Revolution. Uh, I think the 
the first, the 1905 revolution anyway, it involved his grandfather and my uncle who fled Russia and was charged with murdering a policeman like the Black Panthers were accused of. He didn't do it, but his buddy did it and he fled to America. And, and so I had this, you know, family history of, of rev real revolution. But, but I want to talk about Foreman for a minute and the film. Yeah. So this is, among other things, a compilation film, which is what Bruce Conner did, meaning I, I took disparate elements to create this film. One of them are the photographs, which are the result of scanning. So, you know, about 10 or 10 of these photographs have been very famous for 50 years. But in fact, there were 3,000 photographs I shot and I never even looked at. But because of scanning, I was able to go to a little Chinese photo place and for $23 or all, I got all of them scanned. So I literally could just drag them into the film. These are all the outtakes. And that's where you see these girls with the great hairdos and people in the churches. And it's really cool to see that stuff. I am trying to recreate reality because this is gone. This moment is gone. But I'm a realist. And as I did this, you know, I had some recordings I had made in 89 because I did a book on the subject. And I used some of them. I recorded uh, Julian and, and John and Dottie. They were good friends of mine. And I kept thinking, I wish I could find Foreman. I wish I could find recordings of Foreman, and I knew some existed. And I found the mother load, and that's why you hear him speak. And I was going to ask you, Joyce, how do you feel at that moment when you're hearing Jim speaking? Because that's Jim speaking. That is him speaking in 1963 in the churches in the South. That's that exactly what he's saying. Was that, was he in Greenwood? You know, it, I get chills when I got chills when I heard his voice. Um, it was a quintessential foreman, and and I thought about how vibrant he was, and then I thought about the end of his life, you know, and and going to his memorial service that um, was like a reunion of all of us who greatly loved him, and, and but you know, I just I just had a uh, 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 since all over again as to what a significant contribution he made, but I don't feel that he has been recognized the way he should have been. There should be books on Foreman's life. Of course, he wrote one called The Making of Black Revolutionaries, but there should be. Danny, I think the original title of the film, you were going to call it John Lewis and SNCC. And it's interesting because it does feel like both it, it feels like two films in one. Can you talk a little bit about that? It is two films in one, which is, I don't know, it's, but I just want to say this because I like to feel that I'm, a, I'm an underdog and I'm an, in the underground and a, I'm an ignored artist, despite being in the most prestigious museum in the world with Adam Weinberg. Uh, it's been turned on by Netflix Hulu and HBO already. I would expect, no, probably everybody. You're right. I, I began making a film on John Lewis because I had access to John Lewis, and that's the dream sequence, which was done in Denver when Obama was nominated. And I was in his hotel room, and he just woke up, and he tell, tells this amazing thing. He had a, a nightmare. And I, and I love that book. Yeah, I was filming John and filming John and flying down to Washington. And then I thought, and Dottie said, you know, uh, she's a big Julian Bond fan. And Dottie said, you know, John says the same thing all the time. And so I was in Washington and I filmed Julian. Thank God I did, because he died very suddenly. And I'm still horrified. You know, uh, and uh, so I had this film on John Lewis. And, and then it just changed. I found these photographs. I said it should be about SNCC. And the truth is, uh, I, I thought if I make a film on SNCC, it will help young people under, see what I think is a model for fighting against climate change. That's my own personal point of view. Because SNCC worked. And it went into, it, it was a very small group it was its policy to go into the worst areas. I'm right, Joyce, right? 
They said, if we can survive in Macomb, a place where they kill people, and, and they told Bob Zeller, you can't come because you're endangering us because you're white and they're just going to beat us up because they're going to get so mad seeing you. That's yep. what SNCC did. <laughs> and say so when the it was the same thing, there were no white people there. When I showed up, I don't think they had ever sent a white person. And Foreman, who kind of didn't care about this stuff, said, go down to the, go down, find Bob Moses, you know, here's a plane ticket. And I show up. And of course, they threatened to kill me. And Danny, I'm wondering, uh, that what did the streaming services give as the reasons they rejected the film? I know where reasons. I don't fit in the mold, you, you know, uh, and I don't want to, you know, it, I think it, this is a fight about America's perception of reality. You're seeing it right now. We're bombarded with the media. When we were young, the news was 10 minutes long. Now it's endless. And they're basically creating a reality for people. Now there seem to be two realities, which is, of course, idiotic. I think this whole idea of polarization is insane, but we're hammered away and hammered away with this idea like there's only two realities because that simply isn't true. I'm creating my own reality and I don't think they like it. They, you know, one person said, well, make it more like it. So one of the things I love about this, about the film, Danny, is that it's in a funny way, it's not a, it, it, it's not a film. It reminds me of the whole notion of talking pictures. Right. Because Pictures start talking. The one thing I'm struck with each time is where you're, you're filming the, I assume it's Julian on the screen and, it, and it's off kilter so that it looks not like Julian talking, but it looks like the picture of Julian talking. And then you realize it's all about talking pictures, the whole movie. And I just find it extraordinary. Uh, well, for talk, it's, it's an alternative reality. You know, you Edward said he he understood, he grew up studying China painting, where his aunts and mother would go to the library and paint on cups. And that was the first image he ever saw. And consequently, he thought an image was like a real object. So when he saw photographs, he didn't see photographs, he saw objects, as if they were reality itself. And, and I am gonna ask you again, Joyce, SNCC is gone, the office is gone. We got older and we we're still alive, thank God. Jim's dead, McDo's dead. How do you feel? What do you think? Did I do a good job? I mean, this is a terrible thing to say, but you can hear McDo. Wasn't he incredible, McDo? Oh, he was. Oh. No, I mean, I really liked the film. To me, it was like you're having a conversation with all these different people. And it's like a diary, too, you know, a talking diary. Um, was there something missing for you, Joyce? Was the, I mean, is there anything if you kind of, I mean, it, it, of course it's Danny's perception of it. Is there something that you would add to it or, um, uh, you know, is it consistent with how you thought, how you mem remember things? Yes, but there were differences too, you know, each person has their own reality in a way, or, or after all these years, we put this through a lot of different strainers and we come out here where we are now. Um, I, I, I obviously I'm, I'm, I'm accustomed to the formula for documentaries, you know, and filmmakers bring in a lot of different views and points of, and, and historical elements and so on. Um, but your conversation starts, you know, and it just keeps on going and it seems like you could even add more to it if you think about it or wanted to, uh, because it's it it's like a dialogue. I mean, and I think well, actually, you you cut it off appropriately where you did, but I'm speaking of the conversational part of it. It you're describing old friends and and what they were like, and and for those you've kept up with, like the beautiful relationship you and John had, you know it it. Especially in light of his recent death, you know, it's it gives one a lot to reflect on. You, you know, also, John was you John had an intimate, intimate uh, uh, look at John, whereas the, the others have been, you know, this public person. I think that's a real strength. 
I'm just going to ask. Where you, John, John was human, and that's what I wanted to show. I, I peel the onion, as they say. But uh, recently, there's a new uh, biography of uh, John Lewis and the author, I, I think, is it Meekham? I think it was. He compared him to Thomas Jefferson. Yeah, I know. He yeah, also, also called him a saint, and I wouldn't go that far, you know. <laughs> I'm Jefferson, gonna, one thing never... people did was that if you start getting real high, they pulled you right back down. I'm going I'm, I'm, I'm I'm to give you one more question, and then I thought it'd be nice to open it up for some, because we have quite a few people out there. Oh, okay. Um, and and you know, I'd love to know. I mean, this is a this is a moment like the '60s. The struggle goes on. There's so much more to do. What advice would you give to activists or activist artists today? And what do you hope they might take from this film? And what do you think they might hope to take from the um, uh, the model of SNCC? Organize, organize, organize. And I say that because with the new technology that we certainly didn't have, was, that wasn't available to us, um, we knocked on a lot of doors, but we also built sustaining relationships with the people with whom we worked. So I would say um, you know, organize, organize. It's harder to organize. To, I, mean, I think today is much more difficult in some ways than what we faced because the issues are so much more co complex. Um, everything is just so big now, but I think um, there's no substitute for what Foreman would tell us to do, is, and that is to get out there with the people and organize them. You'd say not to the legs off the table. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, uh, I, there was recently a congresswoman. I, I just want to give a shout out to Nancy. She's been sitting my way, Nancy. Nancy helped enormously in the film. She went to Troy, Alabama, it was about 110 degrees. Uh, John was very close to her. John's often speaking to Nancy, doing some of these things. She didn't go to Washington, I was there alone. But what's missing in the film is Joyce, because Julian, I said to Julian, who else should I film? And he says, film Joyce. And so when I knew John was uh, ill, and wanted Rush to see him. Joyce also lives in Washington. The only reason I took my movie camera was I thought, well, I'm in, I'm buying a ticket. I'm, I'm there. I want to film Joyce. And I kept calling Joyce, saying, I'm going to come over, I'm going to come over. And of course, I didn't. That's the only reason I had. Uh, I have a camera. question. I have a question that came up um, uh, from one of our, 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 watch, our watchers. Was there tension among the different civil rights organizations, disagreements that came out into the open? That's one. And was Danny ever asked, asked to photograph by other organizations at the time? There was a lot of conflict between SNCC and the other organizations, especially the NAACP, and, uh, probably only the NAACP, because they, I remember Roy Wilkins, who was executive director of NAACP, said at one point that he was tired of spending NAACP money to get SNCC people these, uh, he con considered wild and rowdy out of jail, you know. And we called them, you know, old people who, who were relics of the past and so on. Um, and we lived differently. We did, didn't we didn't flout the the local norms at all? But uh, I remember when some of us got our cut, hair cut in afros. There there were women who would ask me, "What? When are you going to cut your? When are you going to straighten your hair?" You know, and things like that. Um, and I was making a political statement. I thought, <laughs> but uh, and the boys wore dungaree outfits like they were at a plow right. and a mule, right? Right. The guys wore, wore these overalls and the photo for the promo for this, this um, uh, showing tonight is that of my sister Dory and me wearing these overall skirts at the March on Washington. And the reason was because um, overalls became part of the movement was because the people, people wanted to be able to identify with the 
people with whom they were organizing. But there was a lot of tension, you know, at times um, with Dr. King, you know, who we would accuse of, I think rightly so, of waiting until we had organized, a SNCC had organized in a certain place and then coming in with the cameras, you know, because the cameras followed him, of course. Um, I think you know, in Washington, you know, the, the big miracle was that, that these organizations who didn't all get along actually united for this. That was the brilliance of fired Russian and pulling off the march that these people actually participated. And at the last minute, it almost falls apart because someone, some, there was an archbishop and someone didn't like what John was going to say. And they literally thought, so this was a coalition. And I think speaking as a, as a, as a radical, uh, one of the huge accomplishments of the movement was that it, that it reached across class lines because there were rich, rich black people and they were all the other black people. And they were educated black people and they were all the other black people. And, and the movement brought these people together. Often people didn't even like each other, but you know, I've been in small towns. I reappeared in Albany, Georgia at a panel, uh, like, you know, 20, 25 years after the movement. And there were people on the stage saying, they were, they were all uh, local African-American people. They were teachers. And so I remember one person speaking, and another person said, you didn't do nothing. You stayed at home, didn't do anything in the movement. And they were all yelling at each other because those things were true. And parents didn't want to go, their children to go. They didn't want to lose their jobs. They didn't want their house burned down. So there were all these conflicts. The miracle of the movement was holding people together and, and overcoming that. So, related to that, one of the questions that came in for Joyce, can you say more about what you mean by organized. Can you be really specific about how this was done and what it meant? And um, how can we apply any of it to today? Well, there was a phrase used by SNCC people and it was that let the people decide. And it was bottoms up organizing. And that is instead of going into a community and taking an idea there and, and imposing it on on the people who live there. What we did instead and was to listen to the people, find out what their issues were and to organize around those. And, and often it took a long time for SNCC workers to get a buy-in um, from the local community because a lot, a lot of it is based on just real important fear uh, that they would be murdered as some were, uh, homes burned, jobs lost. Um, but but uh, it was a matter of, of let me give you a, dis a, a distinction between then and now. Because of the great technologies available, um, calls are sent out, you know, you can post on, an announcement on Twitter that there will be a demonstration um, at the Supreme Court tonight, you know, at six. Um, and move on does that very often and very effectively. And you'd have hundreds and sometimes thousands of people turn out for these events. Um, SNCC didn't work with huge crowds uh, uh, or any kind of, we didn't do big marches. That was the SCLC and um, in particular. And WCP dealt with legal issues, so trying to overcome, I mean, overthrow segregation through filing uh, uh, lawsuits. Um, it was a matter of going to a community and working in a sustained, consistent way over time uh, to build the trust of local people, to help to build, build strong leadership. Uh, Ella Baker, our, our uh, advisor, always said that strong people don't need strong leaders, you know, so, so, um, so we're less impressed with how many Twitter followers are, a, a leader of a movement today has, and more with how effective they've been in building uh, local uh, leadership. I have to say, I'm so struck with that statement of Ella Baker, strong people don't need strong leaders, because if you look at the list of people who came out of that, out of the movement, it's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, just 
you know, names that will be remembered forever. I mean, great people and strong people and strong individuals. So it's interesting. It's, um, you know, that, that it was the idea that all the people were strong together, but then you had Lewis and Foreman and Farmer and Bond and Dick Gregory and Rap Brown and on and on and on. I mean, these are names that, you know, all of us who, who remember now. And um, it's, it's an interesting kind of contradiction. Right. Uh, who, who wrote the Dr. King book? Uh, Taylor Branch in the chapter on, on the or creation of SNCC said the greatest minds of a black generation had come together. But you're right. I, I, I had a big old Olsen meal. It was my dad and I was driving it. And in the car were John Lewis, Julian Bond, and I put on some country music like Merle Haggard and a big black arm reached over from the back and turned it off and says, I don't want to listen to that honky shit. That was Stokely Carmichael. <laughs> so it was an extraordinary uh, group of people. And I do want to say something. What's going on is incredible. I don't think we have anything to tell these people. Recently, a congressman was on saying, democracy is in the streets. Democracy is in the streets. It's what's happening in the streets it's what happened in the streets that drives social change. That even means for Roosevelt. These people can't do anything. But the people in the streets, that's the pressure. And that's what accomplishes them. I couldn't have cared less about the NACP or the Voting Rights Act or anything legal. I didn't go to Atlantic City. I was bored to tears by stuff like that. I really loved being in the streets. That's what the movement was that uh, other people, powerful people, educated people, people with real power would actually do something was because of these high school kids. And there were tens, there were thousands and thousands of them. Taylor Branch calls it the fire store. In the summer of 63, when many of these pictures were made, 14,000 people, mostly young black kids in the South, went, went to jail. Think of that. I'm going to end with one, think, uh, we have one last question. And it's great. We have one I last question. Um, we formed the SNCC Legacy Project about 10 years ago, and, and it's a, a, a group of former SNCC members, or always SNCC members, you know, uh, who um, are on a board that continues to carry on the work of SNCC, uh, a lot of it by digitizing all of our records that are housed at Duke University and um, online as well. But and we hold conferences and the one thing that I'm very proud of that we do is the great focus is on building intergenerational leadership. And so mostly we're a support to these young, organ young people's organizations. You know, because as Fanon said, each generation will define its own mission, and carry it out. So I don't think our job is to tell people what to do, but that they find their own voices and we support them. Well, the, last, the last question is sort of related to that too. And it's, um, what do you know now that you wish you knew back then? And what did you know then that you wish you could bring back now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, 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 I can answer the latter. Okay. Uh, the latter is that I mean, if I could just bring back the, the feeling, you know, just one SNCC party you know, <laughs> or, or sitting with SNCC friends, you know, as they hashed out problems or tell tall tales. But it was it was the, the joie de vivre, you know, the, that, the, the closeness and the warmth and closer to many Oftentimes, you're closer to some SNCC members and some members of your family. Julian Bond was often said that. Um, but, you know, if it was part of being a movement. It was just exciting. I mean, it was adrenaline pumping. It was wonderful. And at 77 years old, I would just love to have one day of that. <laughs> Danny, closing words? You know, I, I was reading, uh, there's a great author, I forget his name, it's Chuck. Uh, I wouldn't mind having that back. 
there's a great author about the Spanish Civil War, and he oh he was on the radio. I'm sure he, he just did Spain in our hearts. But he said that du during the wobblies and the really radical labor, that's what it was like. People knocked on the door. They said, I'm a wobbly. You'd let him in, you'd feed him, and give him a place to stay. He said when, and that's what SNCC was like. That's what, how they treated me. That's how everybody treated everybody. They didn't ask anything. They fed you. They took care of you. It was home just because he said, I'm with the movement. And uh, he said, nothing will happen in the present time until people in the movement act like that socially. It's, can you imagine someone knocking on your door saying, you know, I represent the homeless and, and we're gonna march tomorrow and I'd like to eat here and stay here at your house, Adam. <laughs> it's true. So. That was great, and I'm going to say something emotional. I wish John was here. I wish John was here. I wish Nick was here. Yeah. We lost so many people, and with each passing, you know, it's it's like losing one of your close family members. Well, the great thing I think about this film is that it keeps the memory and the visions and the hopes and the dreams and the angers and the frustrations and the need to continue the work. And so Danny, we're all indebted to you for making this film. And Joyce, we're indebted to you for being part of the movement and for being with us tonight. So thank you both. This was really an important night on the eve of an election. And I think how, you know, Joyce, you've been, you and so many others were part of voter registration drives and your photographs, Danny, of the registration drives. Let's hope the people are heard um, and that strong people won't need those strong leaders because the people will be heard this, this coming week. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney, and everybody for making this happen. It's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'll talk to you soon. I'll call you tomorrow. Okay, good enough. <laughs> nice being on a panel with you. <laughs> <laughs> what a pleasure. What an honor. Thank you.